And I didn't have to remind you. Right. That's right. We are recording and Jim didn't have to remind me. Here we are. Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of this four part series on the Book of Common Prayer. I'm glad to be with the folks in the Zoom room as well as broadcasting out to all of you who happen to be watching this at whatever point in the future you're watching it. Um, I thought that we might begin this time today by actually using the Book of Common Prayer. There is a, uh, as, as we talked last week about the, uh, the, the hours, uh, the Benedictine hours and the praying seven times a day, there is a, a, a daily office um, service called Noonday Prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. Now, if you have a copy of the Book of Common Prayer of your own, then I will point you to it. It is on page 103. But just in case you don't, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. And instead of using um, the online Book of Common Prayer, um, what I've opted to do is to make a Google Doc that pastes up the service like we often use for Compline on Wednesday nights. So you can see that right there. And what we're going to do is just pray this very brief order of service for noonday. It is very straightforward and simple. And I'll walk you through it and I'll show you how this is probably the easiest um, piece of the daily office for any uh, lay person to lead. So whenever you're all ready and if everyone can see the screen, uh, we will pray together. Oh, and I should, I should say too, I'm sorry, Zoom etiquette would say that there should be one person unmuting to respond. Uh, however, because there are only four of you and there are five of us total, that's not that many. So how about everybody just unmute and we'll go ahead and let there be a slight cacophony of saying things all at the same time, uh, just because it's not so many that it's out of the question. We'll try this out. Okay. Oh God, make speed to save us. Oh Lord, oh Lord, make haste to help us. And then together, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say together Psalm 121, the one in the middle column. Actually, I was, I, not together. I will read the odd verses and you read the even verses. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes, help from, comes from the Lord, the, Lord, the, maker, the maker of heaven and earth. earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. So that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord, the Lord shall watch, shall over, watch your over your going, going out, out and, and, your coming coming and your coming in from this, from time, this forth time forth evermore. and forevermore. forevermore. Together, glory to the glory Father, to the, Father and to the Son, and, and, and to the Holy, Holy, Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, the beginning is now, and, and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Thanks be to God. 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 Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, Our Father who art in hallowed heaven, be your name. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom, thy kingdom come. come. Your will be, will be done on earth as, earth as it is in heaven. Give us today give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. And give forgive us our, sins our trespasses as we forgive, as we forgive those, those who trespass against, against us. Save us from the and time of the trial, trial, trial and deliver us, and deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Almighty Savior, who at noonday called your servant St. Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles, we pray you to illumine the world with the radiance of your glory, 
that all nations may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. 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 I invite your prayers silently or aloud, bearing in mind we are recording and broadcasting on the internet. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the noonday prayer service. Very quick. And, and uh, there was a time when I was working at St. Paul's Bellingham when there were a few of us who would uh, very frequently just go into the church together around lunchtime and pray noonday prayer together. It took all of four minutes. And then we were back at work again. It was a good anchor in, in the day. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give you a taste of that. That's that's something that you can certainly do anytime that you want. You know, you've got a copy of the Book of Common Prayer, just um, read the noonday prayers and be aware that there are people all over the world who are praying the same prayers at the same time. That's one of the beauties of the daily office is that somewhere out there, other people are praying the same thing at the same time, assuming you're in a similar time zone. <laughs> um, so last week we talked about common prayer in general, about how it is that we even need forms of common prayer, about the fact that we all, all our churches have liturgy because of the necessity of understanding what we're going to do when we get together to pray with more than just one person in the room. Um, so today I want, to I want to take us through the rest of that history. First and foremost, we left off at the Protestant Reformation um, with both Luther and Calvin and Zwingli all doing things on the continent. And then Henry VIII, in England, and we talked about that that uh, transition. So first, a very quick bit of review. If we look back, I know review helps me remember things. When we look back as far as Constantine in the fourth century and the and Christianity becoming legal, um, one of the things to note that happened in the fourth century is that lay participants in the service started to become more distant observers. They weren't necessarily um, as interactively involved in worship. And we talked about how monasticism began as a response to the disengagement of the lay people and the lack of rigor or risk uh, to the business of being a Christian. It became all too expected and safe. So this was an alternative path. Worship became very standardized and it came to be controlled by a moneyed hierarchy. Um, the church became uh, the institution, especially when the Roman empire crumbled in the West. Now, in the Middle Ages, um, people's piety became a lot more penitential. Uh, there was a lot more focus on sin. Uh, there was a lot more focus on guilt. Uh, there was a shift from a focus on Christ's victory over death to an emphasis on his suffering as the antidote for human sin. And people would strive for moral purity. Um, liturgy largely became a clergy activity. Um, there was a theological misunderstanding that every time you celebrated the Eucharist with bread and wine, that it was a fresh sacrifice, such that it was kind of like a renewed temple system. We need another sacrifice and another sacrifice. And it wasn't very good theology. Um, Latin remained the language of the liturgy in the West, even after the people stopped understanding it. In the East, they'd always understood, keep it in the vernacular so the people know what's going on. But in the West, we got stuck on Latin for a long time. Private prayers were said in the pews at the same time that the clergy were doing the prescribed liturgy. So there was a disconnect between those two things. And very few people understood anything that the clergy were doing at the altar. And when there were big crowds gathered, they couldn't even see it anyway. There was baptism done with little or no preparation. Um, usually um, infant baptism was the norm. Uh, it was done very quickly and very fearfully because of skyrocketing, skyrocketing infant mortality rates. Um, there was a real fear that it, uh, babies that weren't baptized would be in big spiritual trouble. And that, that misperception, um, unfortunately, hangs around to the present day, but it really became the norm in the West at that time. There, uh, the catechumenate stopped happening. That is the process by which adults were prepared for baptism through a process of learning and engagement in the church. That just went away almost completely. That's something we're actually trying to revive in our own day and age. Private baptism services remained the norm until very recent decades. Now, in this, you see the seeds of the Reformation. 
Uh, there was scholasticism. This was the restoration of intellectual knowledge that had suffered for centuries. We have the founding of the first big universities in Western Europe and people being able to learn things on their own. Um, the printing press came along, of course. The peasants could read now, and, uh, and then the Bible started to be mass-produced. There was a growing sense that liturgy and the Bible should be in the vernacular where people can understand them. We talked about that transition happening in England, that there were Calvinists involved in that who were trying to bring Calvinism to the continent. Uh, Thomas Cranmer's prayer books of 1549 and 1552, and then the Elizabethan prayer book of 1559, really reflect the political turmoil in England at the time, along with the struggle to determine just how Protestant we were going to be as the Church of England. So today we move on to part two. A hundred years after Elizabeth, What's going on in England, if you know your English history, is that there was the interregnum when Oliver Cromwell was in charge uh, between kings. And then after that happened, we have Charles II uh, coming to the throne um, to replace Charles I, his father who'd lost his head, right? Then you have the interregnum in between. So with Charles II as king, they put out a new book of common prayer, the 1662 edition. This one took a moderate position between the Puritans, who a lot of whom had really been chased off the continent and come, guess where, America, and the more Catholic-leaning high church party of the, of, the, of the time. So the 1662 Book of Common Prayer is still the official one in England, uh, although very few people use it in worship anymore. They have a, a version that came out in 2000 just called Common Prayer that's what's in all the pews. But it would actually take an act of parliament to change the official version of the Book of Common Prayer from the 1662. Oh. Now, over here in the colonies, uh, when, there, when we had our little revolution, there was a problem. How could we be the Church of England when we were trying to cut all ties with England? How could we call ourselves Anglicans uh, when we wanted to slough off all of that connection? In other words, how could we be the Church of England in a newly independent United States? One big problem in this was that it was in the worship service that the clergy would swear allegiance to the monarch that was in every Sunday service. Oh. And that lay people were praying for the monarch in that edition of the Book of Common Prayer, the 1662 version. Well, we couldn't have that. The problem here, too, though, is that because of the system of ordaining priests and bishops, you needed to have three bishops there to consecrate a new bishop. But all the bishops were in England. Oh. And they were our enemies now. <laughs> so how do you get new bishops? If you're going to form a Church of England that is not of England and that is of the United States, what do you do? Well, there was a solution. And that was that we went to the Church of Scotland. The Church of Scotland was separately incorporated um, because although they were in relationship with England as part of the United Kingdom from, uh, from that time on, um, there was an understanding that they didn't have to swear allegiance to the crown. Um, so, yeah, uh, you're asking just what year that was. Um, this we're, we're talking 1789. So we're talking about the time when the founding fathers were creating the Constitution in the daytime, and then wandering down the street at night to the church to work on the Book of Common Prayer for the new Episcopal Church. Um, so they, they used the, the Book of Common Prayer of the Church of Scotland as a big influence. And it influenced um, not only the fact that no longer was there a need to pray for the monarch, but also um, some of our Eucharistic prayers in our prayer book um, show the influence of the Church of Scotland in very specific ways. Um, there were Eastern liturgies that Scotland had gone to that the uh, Roman Catholic Church and then the Church of England hadn't really used. So there was much more of a, a crossover of traditions going on. Um, and then the Scottish Church also provided the solution for being able to consecrate bishops within the apostolic succession of bishops consecrating bishops all the way back to the apostles. The Scots sent some bishops over so that we could consecrate the first bishop of the Episcopal Church. And does anybody know who that was? Any Hamilton fans in, in the crowd? Because he's got a role. He shows up and sings a song in Hamilton. Hmm. Anybody know? He doesn't come off very well in Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical. He was Samuel Seabury. Yes. 
<laughs> Jess is like, oh, yeah, 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 him. Um, he was a loyalist. He did not want a revolution. Um, but in the end, after the revolution, he became the first bishop of the Episcopal Church. And then there were more, of course, that followed. Another thing that happened, uh, because this was the United States, uh, there was a separation of church and state. So no longer would there be a monarch who could tweak the people's common prayer. Um, and technically, we've always been a pluralistic country, although for a long time, the Episcopal Church really was the establishment church. Uh, George Washington was an Episcopalian, um, Thomas Jefferson, many of the founding fathers were Episcopalians. Uh, some of their theology wasn't quite in the ballpark of most Christians. Um, they were really more Enlightenment thinkers who didn't feel the need to be bound by notions like the Trinity, for instance. Um, so there was some of that, but they were, they were involved churchmen in the Church of England. Um, and uh, if you go to Alexandria, Virginia, you can visit Christ Church, where George Washington sat on the vestry. Um, just some fascinating stuff out there. So um, democracy. I mean, we had this democracy thing going on. And so when, the, when they were setting up the Episcopal Church in the United States, they decided that uh, there was going to be a bicameral legislature of the church, basically. And this is still the way it's organized to this day. In the same way that there, is, um, that there are two houses of Congress, we have two houses of our general convention. We have the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies. And, there, and any time that, uh, that we're together every three years at the general convention to make the decisions for the church, uh, there are things that have to be passed by both houses in order to pass. So one of them contains all the bishops and the other house contains elected priests, deacons, and lay people from all the different dioceses of the church coming together in their own house of deputies. It's a fascinating process. And I, um, I once got to attend general convention uh, back when I was a teenager in 1988, it was in Detroit. And uh, my mom was a delegate, my dad was an official photographer, and I got to sit in on a few days of the convention. It was really, really interesting. In fact, I'll share a quick story. In 1988, the Episcopal Church decided to, uh, to divest from all interests in South Africa in order to strike a blow to apartheid, the apartheid regime there. And I remember my dad pointing out to me, they just passed this motion. The Episcopal Church is boycotting South Africa. And you see that guy there? He's going over to a payphone to call Bishop Tutu and tell him the news. <laughs> That's one of those moments I'll remember all my life. But back to the 1780s. Uh, we have a democratic church, right? If you're going to change the Book of Common Prayer, any change has to be made by two consecutive sessions of the general convention, by both the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies. There's no Pope overseeing these prayers, right? So as a result, the 1789 Book of Common Prayer, the first one for our American Episcopal Church, was a fairly radical revision. Uh, but it didn't meet with a lot of resistance because the circumstances were so clearly defined. We needed a prayer book. We needed a church. It was just going to happen. And there was all this Scottish influence that probably most people didn't really know about or understand, uh, maybe for their entire lives. Um, so that went on for a while. Eventually, there was another edition of the Book of Common Prayer in 1892. I've, I've never met a lot of people who know much about those differences. Uh, it was a pretty minor change. And then there was a prayer book that came out in 1928. Now, there are many, many, many people left alive today who grew up on the 1928 prayer book and who really see that as their home. Um, in my time at Good Shepherd, I've even done a funeral out of the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, which we don't use anymore, because the woman who, was, who we were burying specifically stated in her wishes that she wanted to be buried using the 1928 rite. Um, so a lot of people were very attached to that prayer book. Um, but at the time that it came out, there was already a sense in the church that they knew they were going to have to revise it again. There were all sorts of trends going on in Christianity in the West in general. There was a lot more conversation among different denominations, a lot more people wanting to get along, wanting to be one unified church in some ways, at least work together on things. Uh, this even crossed the Catholic Protestant divide uh, to some degree. So when that 28 prayer book came out, they, they set up a continuing liturgical commission to prepare for the next prayer book. And they, their work got uh, waylaid by first the Great Depression and then World War II. But after the war, they started up their work again. 
In the 19th century, the 1800s, there had been a liturgical movement in the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, we kind of left the Roman Catholics behind when we split and started talking about the Reformation, but we shouldn't. We should remember that they had their own Reformation, what's called the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. Uh, I would say basically the upshot of that was for the Catholic Church to look at everything that the Reformers had done and say, you know what, we hate to admit it 100 years later, but those guys had a point. Um, they knew that they needed reform, so they reformed as well. And they were still doing their work of reformation in the 19th century liturgically. In uh, the Anglican Church, that is the Church of England, but all the Anglican churches throughout the colonies, they noticed this. They noticed what was going on in the Catholic Church and learned from it. The Anglican version of this reform movement was called the Oxford Movement. And this was really a shifting of the pendulum back from being a very Protestant church to being a more Catholic looking church. There was uh, bringing back candles and vestments and incense and all the trappings that the reformers had thought were extraneous nothing, you know, and throw them out. There was, they were seen to have real beauty and, and, uh, and importance in worship, so those started to come back. It was a working to reverse some of the Reformation divisions by Protestants reclaiming liturgy, but also the reforming of liturgy on the Roman Catholic side. Lutherans also were heavily involved in this work. And so in the 20th century, this picked up again after World War II. There were concerns that maybe the language of the prayer book had gotten really archaic. Uh, we talked about this last week, how uh, for some people, the Elizabethan language just sounds like church. And for others, it sounds uh, hard to understand. Uh, so there was a the question, are we still in the vernacular if we don't let the language grow with, with the prayer book, even if we're in the same language? There was also, big time in the 19th and 20th centuries, new scholarship of ancient texts that revealed a whole host of examples of what early church worship was like, things we hadn't known before. And it cast into full relief, really, the theological damage that the Church of the Middle Ages had caused. Um, learning what the church used to be like helped us to understand a little more of maybe not the original apostles' mindset, but certainly much, much earlier in the church. There was an understanding that we needed a renewed emphasis on Holy Eucharist. Um, in, the, in the 1928 prayer book and in those times after World War II, the Episcopal Church was very much like many other mainline denominations in that it didn't have uh, communion very often. Um, Eucharist was celebrated maybe once a month, maybe even only once a quarter um, for whatever reason. But the Catholics had always celebrated it every Sunday. And there was seen a value to return to that as the anchor point of worship every single week. Um, also, the, the, the Book of Common Prayer from 1928, it was seen that it really had an undue emphasis on sin and repentance. Sin and repentance is an important topic, but there was, it was really laden with guilt in a lot of ways. There was a lot of you know, self-flagellation kind of, um, it's, it's the kind of thing you don't want to lose because it's important to have that humility and to know that, that, that we sin and need repentance. But this was really seen as the need to swing that pendulum back a little bit more. Meanwhile, in the 1960s, Vatican II happened. It surprised the world. The, the Roman Catholic Church meeting for a, a, their first council in a really, really long time. And the big switch that surprised everybody was that the Roman Catholics said, well, we are now going to do worship in the vernacular instead of in Latin. And so you have people alive today who grew up in a Catholic church that was all in Latin. And then the shift happening in the 60s. This is something I certainly didn't learn about. I'm young enough that I don't remember it. Um, I was born after Vatican, but I learned about it later and find it fascinating that it was so recent. There was a deeper study of ancient Eucharistic prayers, and that resulted in some common English translations of part of the Mass, the creeds, the Lord's Prayer. This is where our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is how everybody knows these words. Because in the 20th century, there was a unification of translations, um, for the most part, with, with just a few uh, differences here and there. There was also um, an ecumenical, and you know, the word ecumenical just means across Christian denominations. There was an ecumenical effort to, um, to look at the lectionary, the, the schedule by which we read certain parts of the Bible on different weeks of the year, and to try to make that a little more uniform. That's been wonderful. The most recent effort there happened in 2006 with what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, such that almost all Protestants that use a lectionary at all are reading the same things together every Sunday. 
So if you went from an Episcopal church to a Lutheran church to a Methodist church to any of them that are choosing to use the lectionary or are devoted to that, you'll hear the same readings. And the Roman Catholics are on a very similar lectionary track as well. Um, so then you see the seeds of a new prayer book. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, there were trial liturgies in use throughout the Episcopal Church, but there were other huge shifts going on as well. In 1974, in August, uh, there's an event that, uh, that took place that I was not quite there for. My brother was. I'll tell you the whole story. In Philadelphia, 11 women were, uh, were ordained as priests. Women had never been ordained as priests before in the Episcopal Church. In fact, the General Convention had not yet said that it was okay to ordain women as priests. This was an act of protest and an act of getting out ahead of the rest of the church. There were enough bishops present who were in favor of women's ordination that they went ahead and did it. My dad was a very young priest who went to Philadelphia and was one of the priests who laid hands on them to pray for them as they were being ordained to the priesthood. My mom was there. My brother was there in utero. I was home with a babysitter. Missed the whole thing. Anyway, there is going to be a documentary coming out very soon about this called The Philadelphia 11. And when I hear more about it, I'll let you know. Well, they didn't have to get out very far ahead because in 1976, the Episcopal Church formally recognized women's ordination. Um, there were other Protestant denominations who were ahead of us on this track. Even uh, some Baptist churches were, were, were ordaining women before the Episcopal Church was. Um, as for updated language, we talked a little about this last week. The church was pretty split on this, about whether to update the language to more modern English. And so the compromise was to have right one and right two. Right one being the, the, the Elizabethan style language and right two being more modern 1970s language. We'll see how long that lasts, right? Um, so the effect of this, the effect of a new prayer book in 1979, that's, that's when our current prayer book came out, was a renewed emphasis on the fact that there are two primary sacraments, the two sacraments that Jesus instituted that he taught his disciples to do, baptism and Eucharist. And these were put back in the center of the life of the church. There was the restoration of Eucharist as, quote, the principal act of Christian worship on the Lord's day. That's how the Book of Common Prayer describes it. With a variety of Eucharistic prayers, not just one, there had only been one in the 28 prayer book, same prayer week in and week out. There are seven in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. There was a, a renewed focus on baptism, and we're still working on resurrecting that catechumenate, a process for, for bringing people to the font, um, uh, uh, for, for preparatory classes and a process of what it means to learn how to be a Christian. Um, I think it takes more than just a couple of classes and more than a couple of, than just someone saying, well, I want to be baptized. If it's an adult, we have an opportunity here to do some teaching, especially since Christianity is no longer the dominant influence in our ongoing culture, right? And that's been a real shift in our lifetimes. No longer is it expected that the typical American goes to church or is even a Christian, you know? Um, we have a lot more people who, who, identify as Christians, but who aren't actually involved in church. And that's another whole phenomenon that's very interesting. So there's also a great deal more variety possible through the 1979 prayer book for what's typically known as the distinction between high church and low church. High church just means more on the Catholic side, lots more liturgy, lots more ritual, uh, lots more trappings. Low church is more on the Protestant side. So if you're at a church that's being led by a rock band, that would be low church. If you're in a church that's flooded with incense, that's probably high church. If you have both at the same time, which is entirely possible, then that just goes to show how much variety is possible within the Episcopal church. So all of this review I've taken out of a book uh, by Vicki K. Black called Welcome to the Book of Common Prayer. And I will just put that in the chat for those of you who are interested. I do have copies at the church that I could loan you at some point when we are all back together again. Now, after the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, there have been some other innovations in the life of the church. Uh, the first was that we had a new hymnal. I haven't really talked about worship music at all. 
But the 1940 hymnal was the one that I grew up on as a young child. And then came the 1982 hymnal. And that's the one that we still use today. Although there have been other uh, hymnals along with that that have come out later, like Wonder, Love, and Praise, and Lift Every Voice and Sing. We have other companion hymnals and all sorts of potential sources for worship music. But typically in a service at Good Shepherd, we're using the 1982 hymnal. Um, sometimes Wonder, Love, and Praise, sometimes Lift Every Voice and Sing, and sometimes a uh, contemporary uh, worship book called Gather. Um, so we have all of those sources for our music. In the 1990s, the General Convention approved a series of books with additional liturgical resources called Enriching Our Worship, New Eucharistic Prayers, New... Um, new rites, new ways of being with people, like things like a house blessing or uh, a welcome of new members or uh, all sorts of things like this. Um, prayers for the death of a child, you know, like very, very specific things that the church might need at any given time. And then there started to be the development of same-sex marriage rites. Uh, that work started in the 2000s, uh, even before the church was recognizing same-sex relationships. And then there came a time when the church was blessing same-sex unions without, without granting them the dignity of calling them marriage. Uh, and then that finally shifted in 2015 at the, uh, the general convention two conventions ago. Um, happened to be the exact same month that the Supreme Court approved, approved same-sex marriage, by the way. Um, so all of that has happened since the prayer book of 1979 came out. Um, that's the first half of my presentation. I, was, I, I also want to talk about Anglican worship and what makes it distinctive, but I also just want to open up for conversation at this point. And um, as for the rest of it, if we get there, we get there. Questions, thoughts? What were the first, the two primary sacraments? Was that um, baptism and communion? Uh, yeah, baptism and Eucharist. Oh, that's wow. right. Yeah. And by Eucharist, I just mean the worship service that contains Holy Communion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So the Protestants would have typically called that the Lord's Supper, whereas the, the Catholics were calling it Eucharist, the, the Greek name. Eucharist is just a Greek word that means Thanksgiving. Yeah. There are all sorts of little tidbits like that. We like a lot of Greek and Latin words in the church and English words, frankly. <laughs> all right, other questions and thoughts? Your mom Is your mom gonna be in that movie, The Philadelphia 11? <laughs> you know what, she was present. I, I don't know that, um, that, that she will be, I don't know that there are any photos of her, but I've seen some of the photos that they're using in it and I do see one of my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool, Josh. So yeah, yeah. How neat is that? All right. All right. Other questions? Book of Common Prayer, the last several hundred years. I know it's a lot all at once. Are they trying to make, is that commission is still existing, right? And then are they trying to make a new one now? Or? Oh, good question. Is there a new prayer book coming? Um, in 2018, they seriously took up that question. Um, will there be a new Book of Common Prayer? I mean, it's been, what? It's been a long time. It's been over 40 years now since the last one. Um, it's been longer. It, let's see, it's been almost longer since the last one than it was from, from the one before. At least time to start talking about it. Um, so that was a really good question. And there have been a lot of um, updates and things. There's the question of the marriage right in the Book of Common Prayer being specifically heteronormative, right? Uh, how long can this book continue to be completely useful to us? And the answer in 2018 that they settled on was, we're not going to make a new Book of Common Prayer at this time. As a matter of fact, we're going to start treating this one rather like England treats the 1662 book that this is our star homing beacon. This is where, this is the one that we start with. And then there are all these other resources out there. And there was a call in that in every diocese, they should form a liturgical commission specifically for the purpose of gathering new ideas and new rights and new resources to be screened by being try, uh, tried out at, in the church at large so that there would continue to be new possibilities added to the prayer book. Honestly, a big consideration in this is the internet. Um, if we have the internet and can access any of these approved rights anytime that way, why should we go through the expense of binding a new book? 
Um, oh. It's a fair question. Uh, there are, of course, those, including myself, who like to have a physical book in my hand that has everything we need. And that is really no longer the case with, uh, with all the transitions we've gone through lately. But there's also a good argument to be made that the church is still learning about the 1979 book and how well and how to use it well. Um, that a lot of the teaching that should have happened in the 80s over this, uh, in a lot of places, just didn't. Um, such that for a long time, there were Episcopalians still griping about this new prayer book. And why can't we go back to the 28 that I grew up on? Yeah. Yeah, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned other hymnals, um, <clears throat> sp specifically uh, one called Lift Every Voice and Sing. Mm -hmm. Is that um, is that uh, concentrated? I don't know how to say it, but uh, does it uh, uh, bring out more of the like black spirituals, African Americans? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I believe it's subtitled an African American hymnal. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it's it's very it's widely in use in parts of the Episcopal Church with large African American populations, mm -hmm. um, and and there are a few of those. There aren't enough, but there are a few. Um, and we do occasionally use hymns from it. Um, I, as I've worked on music with Ruth Ann and with Roy at Good Shepherd Worship Planning, um, we've realized that Good Shepherd uh, doesn't always have, um, I'm not sure that we always have the ability to sing African-American spirituals very well. And so we don't always <laughs> go there. You know, it's like every year we get to a week where we want to sing soon and very soon. And we're like, oh, we love the song soon and very soon. Can we do that? And we try to picture it and it's like, not yet. I'm not sure we're there yet, but um, yeah, but we do occasionally use, um, it has a lot of the really classic hymns um, that, that came out of the Black church experience, um, mm -hmm. and also a lot of hymns that are just beloved by, um, by churches of people of all colors um, that were not really, that didn't start as part of the Episcopal tradition. Uh, a lot of the, like the Baptist spirituals and things that, grew, that people grew up on, um, songs like How Great Thou Art, um, are in there, but aren't in the Episcopal hymnal because that doesn't come from our tradition. You know, it comes from somewhere else. And so it's, it's another way in. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anything else on recent history of the Book of Common Prayer? Feel free to interrupt me later too, if you think of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do want to talk some more then about, um, I want to talk about Anglican worship and what makes it distinctive. Mm -hmm. And for this, I'm going to be following um, most of what I found in a certain chapter of a book called The Anglican Vision by James E. Griffiths. And I've just put that title and author in, uh, in the chat, James E. Griffiths, The Anglican Vision. This is from chapter six of his book. So I'll just present on this a little bit. We talked about common prayer last week and, and why we worship together, why we don't just pray alone and find that sufficient. Um, the way Griffiths puts it, we worship to deal with the question of meaning, to, to deal with the why questions of life, the big questions. And from the beginning, the answer to the question why of because I said so, that, that's always been an unsatisfactory answer. We always need something deeper than that. Uh, just human growth requires it. The ultimate questions deal with problems of, that our five senses can't solve for us, right? Um, the, the, those why questions especially. And when we find that there's something that our five senses can't solve, we really have four choices. One is that we can conclude that there must not be anything beyond our five senses, right? You can be a total materialist and say, no, nope, this is all there is. There is nothing transcendent, so no need to go there. That's one option. A, section, a second option would be to decide to create certainty where there was none before, right? To just decide to be certain about things that you don't know. And that may involve some level of intellectual dishonesty, um, maybe, or maybe it's really just the best you can do. Like, well, I'll never know, but my gut tells me it's this way. And so therefore I'm deciding that that's my certainty, right? A third option is that we can decide to deprioritize such questions and not ask them, right? That, that we know there's more beyond the five senses, but I've decided it's just not important. I've met people like that. I don't quite understand them. People who find the whole religious life to be just pointless and, and uninteresting. Um, 
I don't get that personally, but I've known plenty of people in that camp. Fourth, we can decide to wrestle with the big questions without requiring that they be utterly solved. That we, we engage the questions with faith and hope and trust and love and in community with one another and just try to muddle through. And, and that, trust that we will learn things this way and that this will give us a way forward. Now, I'm convinced that we all do all four of these things. But I think that the religious life is generally concentrated on the fourth one when it's done really well. This, it's about the wrestling. It's about living those questions. And when we take that fourth option, that's when we open ourselves to worship. Worship arises out of wonder and not knowing uh, all these wondering questions that we can ask. What is important? Why? Um, why, why is it this way? So the next step in this process of wondering is to tell stories that give meaning. We pass on the stories that have been handed down to us that have survived because they carry wisdom. And often the scientific veracity of these stories is way less important than the meaning that the stories provide. So look at it this way, many factual stories are unhelpful to our wondering, right? Um, they, we might know a thing is true and factual, but that doesn't help us. Meanwhile, many fictional stories are actually helpful to us. We all have our favorite novel that we know is fictional, but that taught us something very deep about ourselves, right? And that's kind of adjacent to, to some of the, the, our own sacred stories. The stories connect us to our history. They enable our participation in a drama that is much bigger than ourselves so that we can find our place in it. And they place our questions in the context of needing to, uh, it, it, they place our questions in context instead of needing to answer them definitively. They just place them, like placing questions next to each other without answers can often get us a lot farther than just having to answer that one question. Here's an example. The story of the Exodus in the Bible. This is the formative story for Jews, right? You ask anyone who's Jewish, their, their guiding story is the Exodus, freedom from slavery in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea into the wilderness through to the promised land. That is the founding narrative of Judaism. I mean, imagine how this story might have helped Jews who were suffering through the Holocaust. Right, you are, uh, you are under oppression now, but you have this history, God freed you, God set you free. You've had to wander in the wilderness in your freedom, but then you're going to be brought to a promised land. The story is so, so crucial. Now Christians take that same story and reappropriate it. Now generally the word reappropriation sounds like a bad word, right? We, we've become accustomed to, oh, you're reappropriating. Um, but there is a, there is legit reappropriation that goes on in all religions as we tell our stories over time. We come to a story we had before and we were in a new situation and we go, oh my gosh, that story fits here too. So the Christian Exodus story doesn't leave behind the Jewish Exodus story, but it does reappropriate it to talk about Christ's death and resurrection. You can see this especially when we worship at the great vigil of Easter, that it all that one of the central stories there is the parting of the Red Sea and the people crossing through to freedom. This is, it's laid aside as a parallel with Jesus going down into death and then rising again. Um, it's another way of using the story that doesn't remove its original meaning. The story of Christ is the central story for Christians, and it's made real to us in worship. And the central ways that we do that in the church are through baptism and Eucharist, those two big sacraments. The sacraments, we'll talk more about that in one of the later weeks, but those are the two biggies. So liturgy, it's, it's performative, right? We're kind of performing something when we do it, but it's not like putting on a play, right? It's not merely putting on a play for an audience. Uh, you'll often hear people who are less accustomed with the ways of the church look out at the people gathered in the congregation and say that they're the audience. That's not the audience. That's the congregation. They're participating. It's not like in a play where we sit and passively watch. 
So it is performative, but it's not a performance. If there is a play, if, the, if we can call it a play, then maybe the audience is God. Except that then we find that God is actually participating too, which is the whole point of the sacraments, that God is also involved. It's more like playing with God than acting something out. So the ritual actions of baptism and Eucharist, they're not reenactments, right? We're not all showing up dressed in the appropriate clothing of the first century. We're not trying to make it such that it's exactly the same way so that we can, it's not like we're making a movie that's trying to be historically accurate. It's, we're not, um, it's, it's more like the narrative into which we place our own performed lives. If your life is a performance, if Shakespeare was right and all the world's a stage and we're all, we're all the players, um, what we're talking about is liturgy as the context into which we place those lives. The frame for the picture that we and God are creating together, this weekly touch point with this drama that is much larger than we are ourselves. And one piece that's crucial to that story is eschatology. Um, I, I used that word this morning. I'm going to use it again and put it in the chat. Um, it's a word not a lot of people know, wonderful Greek word, but it really means the study of the end or fulfillment of all things. Um, you, can, you can talk about that as, if you want to talk about it in a narrow way, it can be the study of the end times, right? How's the world going to end? But in a larger sense, it's the study of what are all of God's hopes and wishes for this world and how will they be brought into fulfillment? This is something else that's going on when we gather for liturgy. We practice having the courage to believe in God's ultimate victory over all the, fe uh, the fear and the uncertainty in our lives. God's universal happy ending is still our North Star, right? So when we put sacraments and eschatology together, the idea is very mystical. The idea is that we are kind of collapsing time and space in a way. Um, we are present in Christ's baptism when we baptize. We are present at the Last Supper when we share the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, along with everyone who has ever come close to these sacraments, that all the baptisms, all the Eucharists are joined together in this mystical way. So ideally, participation in weekly worship or even daily worship or daily prayer enables us to better approach the confusing issues of the world around us. We, we start to hold these things up against our own Christian narrative as well. What's my own Christian story? What's my spiritual autobiography? How has God been in my life? What do I know? What do I suspect? Um, what do I wonder? So we are incorporated into the church through baptism, and then we are renewed and strengthened through communion over and over again to do the work that our baptism began in us, right? One baptism, but communion over and over again. And we trust that God is working in and among and through all of us in this. And hopefully quite often we catch God at work. We say, ah, God was there doing that thing. Yeah. So one word for what makes Anglican worship distinctive, we are incarnational. Um, incarnation, the, the notion of, of God becoming flesh, right? When we talk about the incarnation, that is the story of God becoming human. And that is a central focus for Anglican worship, incarnation. It goes way beyond just assenting to the idea that God exists, um, you know, sometimes we talk about the omnis. God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. God must be all these things. It's a very platonic understanding of God. But Jesus showed us that all of these omnis would be incomplete if God never came to be with us and to see the world through the eyes of the created beings in it. The, the all-knowing God couldn't know everything except by becoming one of us. There's a lot of theological energy expended in trying to understand how Jesus could be both God and human at the same time. But however it happened, whatever it was, whatever it is, that's the Christian claim, right? Even if we never fully understand it. Despite that claim, 
a lot of people still don't get beyond the idea that God must be remote and beyond. Um, watching us from a distance, as Bet Midler sang, terrible theology. Um, maybe even potentially unconcerned with us, despite having authority over us. Uh, in, the, in the early times of the church, there was, there was the heresy of Gnosticism that in some versions claimed that humanity is so sullied and sinful and awful that God must not even be aware of us. If God were aware of us, it would make God less than. So therefore, God can't know we exist. I mean, this is, these are the extremes that you can go to. And that, and that would be, that's called a heresy because it goes outside the realm of what we can reasonably assess to be the truth of our faith. The heresies show us the extremes to which we, we could go, and that's helpful. But Jesus is God among us, quite the opposite of God unaware of us. Because Jesus suffered, we know that God suffers with us. God cares. Now, many people, even outside the church, claim a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Some of them feel too hurt by the church to belong to it. And honestly, I can hardly blame them. That's, that's a situation that just needs lots of healing. Or maybe they feel too impatient with its obvious imperfections and hypocrisies. Like, you know, looking at the people in the church, well, if the church were really that great, it would be better at what it does, right? That, that would be like, okay, yeah, yeah, you've got a reasonable claim there. Other people are too wrapped up in their own wishes and desires and, and the day-to-day -day lives to make space for other people in their spiritual lives. Um, I, I knew someone who was a navel gazer, you know, who would take two to three hour baths with candles and incense. And, and I was his roommate. <laughs> I had to use the bathroom. <laughs> um, but, you know, th there are people who would prefer that their confusing universe would be reducible to just me and Jesus, right? I don't, don't worry about any of these other people as long as I've got right with Jesus. But the world doesn't work like that. And Anglican worship asserts that the church is what keeps us in relationship with God as lived out in our relationships with others. Baptism invites a whole community to be part of our growth in Christ. It's not an individual pursuit. Confession. Um, you know, there's the immature idea of confession would be that we have to keep from doing certain things that are sinful so that God will keep loving us more. Um, but a more mature idea of confession is that sin means broken relationship and that confession is the way that we own our part in that break. Until we confess, we're not ready to help mend the relationship. So confession puts flesh and blood on the forgiveness that Jesus assures of, uh, us of. And we learn that while God's love will never fail us, it can and must inspire us to keep paying attention to our actions and their effects. We want to reflect the love that has been shown to us. And that's why we confess our sins. One of my favorite lyrics from Mumford and Sons, which I've probably quoted in a sermon, it's not the long walk home that will change this heart, but the welcome I receive with the restart. And so we confess. We also have the offering. We offer ourselves. Um, one of the sentences of offering is that we offer our souls and bodies to God. Um, the offering has really taken a back seat in our online liturgies. I'm trying to bring it out a little more right now, but we can't pass a plate right now. And so it looks a little different. Um, offering means courage. It means a willingness to let go of some of our hard won control. And that includes control over our money, right? When you make a pledge to the church, you are taking a chunk of your lifeblood that you worked hard for, and you're saying, this part was never mine to begin with here. Um, and that's, that's a practice that takes courage. But the understanding of the offertory is that we're not just giving money. We're not just paying for the show. We're not just paying dues. We're giving ourselves. Sometimes when I've been at a church service without any cash on me, when they pass the plate to me and I don't have anything to put in it, I at least make sure to hold the plate for a moment and put myself in it before passing it on. Then we have Holy Communion. And Holy Communion ties us to one another in the body of Christ. We take the bread, bless it, break it, give it. We, we feed one another and we are all fed by the same bread and the same cup. It's all incarnational. This is all about bodies in space and in time 
um, being involved in God's world. And at the end of worship, we are dismissed to go out and repeat this pattern to the world. Uh, take ourselves, bless ourselves, break ourselves, give ourselves away. We go find the Holy Spirit at work and go join in to help in all of our unique ways. So that's an overview real quick of what makes Anglican worship distinctive. That's not to say that that stuff doesn't exist in other churches, but just that that's definitely a center of what it's like to worship in an Episcopal church or an Anglican church. Thoughts on that? Questions? Revelations? Very helpful, Josh. Okay. How so? Well, I, although I've taken other classes from you and stuff, I, I feel like my memory, I can't hold so much info. So it, when I take them over and over, then it starts to seep in. I'm probably using notes from a class I taught with you in it <laughs> before. <laughs> I really like, I seem to have gotten it, but I take notes. I take copious notes. So I'm going to read them later, but I like the, what you said about um, the four ways to be from that book. Um, and that's very interesting. And, I, you know, I've been thinking about it lately because so many of my friends that I love, you know, they're, they don't, they're not religious at all, or they don't believe in God, or they used to, but they, whatever. And, and it seems like, maybe I'm wrong, you guys tell me if I'm being too judgy, but so much of what I see on social media, for instance, it just seems so self-serving. Like I don't hear about people trying to help others as much as, oh, look what I bought. I spent all this money and bought all this stuff for myself during the pandemic. Yay, you know, and maybe I'm just jealous. I wish I had a lot of money and stuff, but I, is it wrong? I just feel like so many people think about sex and money and, and drinking, a lot of drinking and partying and not wearing masks and stuff like that. <laughs> And it's irritating me. Am I wrong? Am I, I feel like I'm being judgy. I'm like, I'm religious. I'm better. But that's not what I mean. I just. The, the question is, is that. What? That's what I'm. My point is, I feel like a lot of stuff, people, I feel like they, maybe they feel empty inside or something. I don't know. So here's the question. Are the only people you see doing that people who aren't Christians? No. No. <laughs> no. Right? I think yeah. that's a human thing. That's not a religious, yeah. not religious thing. I didn't thing. mean to pinpoint, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It just, I, I don't know really how to explain what I mean, but I feel like I wish more people had a spirituality, not necessarily Christian, but just something more. I feel, I feel like I, people are like almost in despair because all they have is this world or something i don't know yeah yeah i um you know you'd be you'd be hard pressed to find an atheist who would say i know i'm missing a spiritual life right um or who would say i have needs that aren't met that religion would fill i mean you know there's a reason people are atheists in the first place um i, I it's not a very popular uh, line of argument to say to somebody who's not religious um well you're missing out on a lot um, that, that doesn't tend to go very well. Um, you know, it was a revelation to me the first time that someone suggested that Instagramming your food is a way of showing off. Uh, oh, really? Oh, oh, I've done that. Was I showing off? I think I need to go do some self-examination. You know, the, the Christian response to being called up short should be self-examination. And at which point one of the answers might be, uh, I think that was an overreaction. I'm not going to worry so much about it. But another answer might be, oh, wow, that's a perspective I hadn't thought of before. And there's a step there of confession, right? And confession there doesn't mean, oh, I'm so awful. I Instagrammed my food. I was just <laughs> showing off. That's terrible. No, that's just a matter of, oh, I didn't realize that that was one of the effects I was having. Maybe I won't do that again. Or maybe I can find a way to put that in a different context. And that's just for a tiny, tiny little thing like Instagramming your food. Um, the life of, of Christians does call us to continual repentance and renewal, not because we're terrible, horrible, and not because we're not, right? I mean, we can't ever be perfect. Some people really need to hear about how imperfect they are. Other people really, really need to hear how loved and wonderful and awesome they are. 
And it just depends on, you might even be the same person at different stages of your life. Both are true. Both are true. And we are constantly growing and learning together. Does that help? I feel like I circled that. I'm not sure I ever yeah, zeroed in on it. I appreciate that. And I have to look at myself too. I've looked at stuff that I, what I'm doing online or what I'm projecting. And it's, oh, yeah. I self analyze constantly. It's, it gives me a headache. But you yeah, know. no, me too. I, I'm sometimes guilty of sharing things on social media because I'm upset about them. And then I don't think about a larger context for them, right? Um, when I'm doing better at that, then I can post something that I'm angry about but then offer some thoughtful reflection on it that is more empowering and not despairing, right? And so I think that's that's an important thing too. You could do a whole, well, there could be a whole class on Christian use of social media, I bet. Yeah. So some some comment back to to some of that is, you know, some of the stuff that I think about in response is, um, you know, like, uh, uh, somebody has to be forgiven much to understand um, forgiveness mm. um, it, it is kind of what what comes to me with with people understanding that people out there are hungry and needy. Um, you know, if somebody hasn't been been in that position very much or hasn't experienced or, or doesn't have a friend that's been that way, they have a hard time relating to it. Right. And, and they don't understand the disparity of it. They don't understand, you know, they just don't quite get it. They don't see the importance of it. They don't, they can't connect to it. There's not a big connection. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they wouldn't, they wouldn't jump all over it. They would, um, but they just don't know how to connect to it at all. Right. And, you know, you don't just jump up and say, I'm going to go find something really unpleasant to connect with right now. <laughs> yeah. So that would just be great. I would really love to be changed. <laughs> right. You know, so, you know, it's just not what you're trying to do to yourself usually. And so I, I think everybody's trying to make themselves feel good, you yeah. know? And so it's just a lack of, of people's own connection and understanding with what's out there is sure and that has effects on other people um I, yeah. I i would certainly be a far more judgmental person if i hadn't also had an experience of myself as a sinner right as as a forgiven sinner as as someone who needed forgiveness and got it um mm -hmm. you know from god and from others that enables me to be less judgy of other yeah. people yeah. Yes, I see you have to go. That's fine. We're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes anyway. We're glad that you're here. So thank you for being with us. And we'll continue next week. Um, yeah, all of that. And notice that we went straight from talking about the, what Anglican worship is like to real world questions of social media. Now, <laughs> I don't remember how we made that leap. But I think what it illustrates is that Anglican worship is not divorced from our daily lives, that the idea is that it helps connect us to our daily lives, that I mean, you'll find Christians all over the place going to church to do their weekly thing because it's a duty or because it's a hit of feel good or something, and then going right back to being how they were before. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't also happen in the Episcopal church, but I do think that Episcopal worship is really carefully geared toward connecting with our lives toward mm -hmm. giving us a, a vessel to put our lives in and to look at it in a new way. Yeah. Well, when you said that um, worship is uh, 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 being part of God's, God's, um, I'm not, I can't remember how you said it, but I, I you know, I'm, I'm visual, I'm visual. Mm -hmm. And so everything goes through into a visual picture. Okay. Um, but um, how, uh, we're, we're all part of, of God's interaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we're interacting with God. We are right. we're part of God's show in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what we're doing in, in a worship service. Yeah. We're, we're being part of God. So we're not spectators. We're not, we're not. Right. We're, we're playing with God. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and we're, we're, we're in his, we're in his playground. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, and so that helps a lot, um, kind of reframing things and 
and um, and looking at all those perspectives, the way you you put the whole thing into context. Um, you know, this one follows this. This follows up on your baptism. This follows, you know, each each of those things. That was really helpful. Okay. Yeah, and and I would say. I, I would never say that the church is the only antidote, antidote to despair. I would not say that because I don't have enough experience to be able to name that. But I would say it is for me. And I would say that the habit of weekly worship, the habit of weekly worship in a community, which is a habit that was cultivated for me from my childhood by my parents, and which at some point after a bit of a gap, I picked up for myself and ran with. And that habit during COVID has come to my rescue. This weekly touch point of worship keeps me in community with people who are not all despairing at once. Uh -huh. Okay. So we carry each other. And I, I keep quoting mm -hmm. this one U2 song, the one called One. Um, we get to carry each other, Bono sang. Um, and I, I said something like that in the sermon today. Um, it, it, you know, the same goes for things like uh, sometimes people complain, well, the Nicene Creed has things in it that I just don't, I'm not sure I believe. So I don't think I can participate in church. And, okay. and my answer is no, no, no. You, you show up, you say the creed or don't, and you're surrounded by all these people who are saying the creed. And in your disbelief, they, in their belief, are carrying you. Your turn may come some other time. <laughs> Right. To be the one with the belief who is carrying others in their unbelief. Right. Uh, that's why we do this together, because as individuals, we just can't yeah. get very far. Yeah. 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 I used to think that about the Nicene Creed. Now it's my favorite. <laughs> OK, well, there you go. You <laughs> exhibit I would love it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I would love for our churches to be full of people who don't quite believe in the Nicene Creed. Because we, we have to, we need help to be made bigger than our own blinders, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need other people with their experiences to surprise us with, with things we'd never thought of before that suddenly make belief possible in a way that it wasn't before. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to believe the virgin birth was literal. I don't think that's required. Um, I have to be careful how I say that. Because some people hear that as, oh, anything goes. I'm like, no, no, I think that just means that's not especially central. There are, that it points to something much, much deeper that's really going on here. And I think that's the case with a lot of our, a lot of our stories and a lot of our beliefs. When I preach today that when Matthew and his, and, and his version of Jesus' parable about the, uh, the, the eternal party, uh, when he stops everything to go reenact the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, I don't have to agree with Matthew that God was putting divine retribution on the Jews in the temple. Um, I think that's anti-Semitic and awful. I can also understand Matthew working through his trauma right after that event with all these other people who were opposed to those who had opposed them. I can see that. But with 2000 years of hindsight, we don't have to agree with him about that point. So I guess, you know, that's, that leads to a couple other things about Anglican worship. There are, there are, there are, I, I was going to start talking about Anglican worship in another way before I found these other notes, but I'll just add a couple more points. Anglican worship is number one, Bible-based. Now you'll hear that phrase tossed around and used as a weapon to attack churches like ours, right? But just try finding another church where you hear so much of the Bible in the course of a worship service. We're using it. We're not just reading it on our own. We're bringing the Bible to bear on mm -hmm. our lives. Uh, it's more communal than individualistic. We've talked about that a lot. Um, it needs all of us. It can be very vulnerable. Um, can is the operative word. You know, you, you can show up at Episcopal worship week in and week out and not be touched by it. But I rather think that's a decision that, that's, and a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Liturgy should make space for someone to be vulnerable, to laugh and to cry and to be humbled. Um, singing in public is vulnerable and kneeling is vulnerable and confessing our sins, even when it's everybody saying the prayer together, that's vulnerable. 
Crying is vulnerable, and I've seen that happen a lot in churches. Washing one another's feet. I mean, we literally do that on Monday, Thursday. That's about as vulnerable as it gets. And yet our liturgy also gives people room not to be vulnerable today, right? You can go in and sit in the back and not be vulnerable and protect yourself, but still be present to what's going on. So it makes room for both of those possibilities. We don't emotionally manipulate people, hopefully. Right. right? Many churches make that the centerpiece of their worship. Yeah. Emotional manipulation. I, I'm, I'm just going to call that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we give people we give people space and a choice. How vulnerable will you be today? And what's happening in the liturgy is not necessarily instinctive. I think that's one reason that we're not a booming, growing, thriving church. We're actually a shrinking church right now and quite rapidly. Uh, I think part of that is because we live in an era when people uh, want instant gratification, instant understanding of whatever it is they're going through, entertainment at all costs. And that's just not the world we're operating in. We are all celebrating the liturgy together, even if it looks like a teacher in a class or a performer in an audience. That's not really what's going on. Um, it's hard to explain what happens in Holy Communion. We'll talk about that more in the, when we talk about sacraments. Um, so a willingness to let things be mysterious is right and true and proper, but it doesn't necessarily attract hordes of people. Um, the Episcopal Church is a well-kept secret. And I love to imagine marketing ourselves to the masses with really clever slogans. Um, but typically, we do our best evangelism work through word of mouth. That's what works best. Congregations that understand themselves as communities instead of just a loose affiliation of individuals tend to be the best ones at inviting and welcoming new members. And like Jesus said to his first disciples when he called them in John's gospel, he just said, come and see, come and see. You know, this is, come and see this thing that I do on Sunday mornings. I mean, KJ, you did that today. Hey, Rachel, come and see. I do that every Sunday, but, and sometimes I get some takers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The goal is not to make everyone into an Episcopalian. The goal is to help people find a connection to God that may or may not continue in the Episcopal church. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Josh, do you remember those ads or, or Jim? And I forget, I'm sorry. I forget your name. Jim. Oh, Jim. Jim, and Jim. There we go. Jim. Mm -hmm. What was it? Judy? Jenny. There it is. Jenny. Uh, do you remember the ads the Episcopal Church put out in, uh, was it the 80s? It was the, the late 80s, and I remember seeing full-page ads in the Seattle Times and some other things. I didn't know what Episcopal was, and you guys, it's really funny. When I, Even though it had a cross and the symbol, I thought Episcopal was sort of like Rosicration. Have you heard of that? Or some weird, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was some weird thing because of the word, Episcopalian. I was like, huh i didn't bother looking it up because i thought it was like a name they made up isn't that funny uh, but the ads were full page ads but so that, that would have been the, that would have been the diocese of olympia doing an ad campaign in the 80s i'm sure yeah that it was pretty cool i mean and i thought gosh what's this i wish i would have gone to saint mark's at that point but i didn't huh when uh when my family was uh in, in idaho when i was a kid in the early 80s um, the Diocese of Idaho did a bunch of, uh, did a big ad campaign with um, newspaper ads, TV ads. I mean, they, they really invested a lot in it. And uh, I'll just tell this story and then we can stop for today. Um, I have a great memory of when I was about 11 or 12, we, we drove out to a farm and we all went into this wheat field and we set up an altar and the few of us who were gathered, which included my mom, my brother, my best friend, my cousin, and maybe three other people, right? We were all there and my dad was the priest and he started, we, we posed celebrating Holy Eucharist in a wheat field. And the idea of the ad was that um, we love the beauty of nature and the church loves the beauty of nature. And we invite you to pray and worship God with us today for the beauty of nature. Right. It was just a really lovely ad set in a wheat field. And just as we were filming the ad, a whole bunch of combines went by <laughs> right behind us. It was perfect. It was not expected. It was not planned. It just happened to be the combines went by and it made for an absolutely perfect TV ad. Oh my gosh, I'd love to see that. 
I'd love to, I'd love to see it too. I have a I have a newspaper ad of of, of that shot. Uh, I don't have any uh, video footage, although I'm sure it exists somewhere. Well, yeah. Let's make some videos this summer. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know I like making them. Yep. All right, you guys. Any more questions today before we move on? No. No. That was great. Thank Thanks. you. Thank I'm you. Really, I'm really enjoying this time with you all. And uh, we'll see you next time for part three. And uh, yeah, looking forward to and it. I'm and just all, yeah. I'm just wondering how many parts do we, can we expect to look forward to? Oh, this will be a four part. This will be a four okay. part. I, I thought so, but I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah. And then I'm still trying to figure out what to do in November with this time slot. The, the problem right now is I don't have anyone to teach it, but I would love to do a three-part class on the Christian year and the seasons and observances of them. So stay tuned. I'm looking for someone to teach the class. Um, I don't know if I want to teach it because I'm not getting a member, but I do have a hardcover book that has all the illustrations and everything like that. Ooh, okay. Of the year. Okay. You might want to use some of those illustrations I could send you. Yeah. 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 All right. We'll see what we do. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Have a great thanks, day. Bye. And thanks, everyone watching online. Thank you. Thank you.